this is my sim setup. I have spent the last two years or so getting it all configured, testing, building, unbuilding, rebuilding, tearing everything apart, selling old components, etc., etc., etc. I've learned a few things over that time period. Uh, I want to share what I can with you as I remember it. Um, like I think a lot of people, I have one computer. I don't see a whole lot of reason um, in most circumstances to have a dedicated Simrig PC as long as you can figure out how to make it work for both. Uh, in my case, that means a completely distinct Simrig uh, apart from the desktop, but it has to be close. Uh, this is a 120 hertz display, um, as most of you would be using. You need DisplayPort cables to do that. Uh, DisplayPort cables degrade over a fairly short range. So you have about a 10 foot cable run to do it. Um, because my setup is out in the living room uh, where it needs to be pretty and put together, uh, I need to have tidy cable runs for the most part. Um, which means I can't have it very far from anything else. So uh, what I've done is I put the whole thing together onto carpet sliders uh, so I can pull it out of here as I need to. Uh, everything is wired up to the PC. Um, sound is going to headphones, which are connected via a 10 foot XLR cable uh, and then mounted centrally so they can reach both to the cockpit and to the desktop without switching inputs. Uh, and then I have a whole bunch of little little tricks um, that I've figured out as we go. So I'll start with, start with a couple little ones. Uh, Stream Deck. The Stream Deck is your friend. Uh, I started with a little baby one. I now have one, two uh, big, big ones. Uh, and they are really delightful for a whole lot of reasons. I'll show you the one that's on the sim rig in a minute. Um, you can do a whole lot of stuff with these. I can change the lights around the room. I can control media. I can uh, mute and unmute Discord. But the big thing that is particularly useful in switching back and forth between the two is I can program um, an audio input swap on a button press, which is really nice. Red, in this case, is speaker audio, and then green is the headphone audio. So I can flip at, at a moment's notice, um, particularly uh, anyone who has spent a significant amount of time sitting down in a sim rig will know you sit down, you strap yourself in, maybe you have seat belts, maybe you don't, but you schlep your entire thing over there, you sit down, and then you realize, oh shit, I've forgotten something. And then you gotta unstrap and get back up. Uh, having as much as possible accessible from within the cockpit while you're strapped in is kind of a, one of the core building blocks in making all of this work. and not being egregious. Uh, and that, that audio switcher is one of those things. I have found that uh, as I continue to add components, and if you're looking at this, I'm not gonna go through everything that's built into this rig um, in this video. Maybe if people like this, if it finds its way out to the internet at large, I'll, I'll talk through how everything's built. Um, but know for the purposes of this video that I have a whole lot, probably too much, um, componentry into this that all needs its own software and its own little fiddling to get working. Um, that can be a huge pain. So figuring out a way to automate that and to make it all work seamlessly and to lower the, the barrier of entry to I'm sitting at my desk, I'm doing work, I'm doing whatever, and I want to go and sit down and race, making that transition as seamless as possible um, is huge in, in making sure you actually use the thing that you've spent countless thousands or tens of thousands of dollars building. Uh, yeah, so we'll go over the display stuff first. Um, you'll notice I have two displays. One is dedicated SIM display, one is dedicated desktop display. When I first started out, I had the desktop display on a big swing arm. I would pull it over. I had the thing on sliders. I would pull that over uh, and then I would sit at the desk. That wasn't conducive to racing practically because too much setup and teardown time meant I wasn't using it as much as I wanted to. So two displays, um, but switching between the two is not very easy. Windows doesn't make it uh, very simple. So I figured out a little workaround. 
Um, specifically, I keep this display off. Uh, I was just fiddling with it, so we'll see if it works. But with this display, um, what I can do is hold the Windows key and P and flip through my projection options. What I want it to be on is second screen only, and I'll just leave it there. Uh, and what should work when this is all set up is I'll reach down and I'll turn this display on. And as it fires up, you should see that one has gone dark, um, which may or may not be important to you. I like to race in HDR, so I want to keep things as streamlined as possible and not confuse Windows' um, rather shitty implementation of HDR, period. Uh, and then when you're done, you can just reach down here, power it off, and then the desktop display will come back up. So typical, uh, typical setup as I'm sitting down to race, uh, I will make sure that my volume is at an appropriate level. I'll come over here, plop myself down in the cockpit and turn this on. Uh, and then within the cockpit itself, I've got a few switches. So everything that needs power as I sit down which is uh, the power supply for these fans, um, some of the USB stuff, um, some of these, the Arduino on the back, um, the amps that are powering the four big butt kickers under here. All of that stuff doesn't need to be on when I'm not sitting in the cockpit. So what I uh, did as kind of a, a low rent option to make all that work was I got a power strip that has a remote control. I uh, have it tucked under here uh, and then this is just VHB to the cockpit itself. So I push that button, amps turn on, fans turn on, everything turns on and it's easy to do from within the cockpit. Um, same thing with the wheelbase, quick release is right there, I can reach it while I'm strapped in, I can power on or off the wheel, really useful. Um, while we're on this topic, if you don't know what VHB is, it's a 3M basically double-sided tape product. It stands for very high bond. I believe it is double-sided tape on steroids. Um, half of this cockpit is held together with VHB. You can never have enough of it. It's fantastic. Stream deck, button boxes, um, a lot of this stuff, this power supply, this, a lot of this stuff is mounted um, via, via VHB and it is extremely useful. So, um, we'll go through kind of startup procedure, I suppose. If I wanted to start a race, let's go here, we'll check out a practice session in the F3 as I'm set up to race that right now. Let's say I want to go into this French practice session. Um, so, the, the chair, the shakers, um, a whole bunch of other components need software launched as I boot the game. Um, that is SimHub, Crew Chief, uh, the SimuCube 2 software, Sim uh, Commander, and then maybe depending on whether or not I'm using it, this iRacing SLI thing. Um, that is a pain in the ass to do one by one. Again, the Stream Deck helps out a lot with that. I have this start button set up. Let's see. I can show you what this does. So built into this is a macro, um, just opens Sim Hub, Sim Cube, Crew Chief, Sim Commander, and Power Mixer, which powers this, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I push that, everything's on, chair's on, it all works. So in here, Crew Chief starting up. Then I'm just gonna uh, allow admin access for Sim Commander, which is Another another issue that's very poorly written software that is frustrating that it makes you do that every time and Windows doesn't have an easy workaround for that. Um, that's also going to turn on my dashboard, which is right here. This is just an Android tablet running um, Sim Hub, and then it's one touch on the top to set this up. Um, sometimes it'll time out, so I'll end up just closing it, reopening it. Uh, and then selecting my dashboard. I'm almost always using this Universal Sim Hub dash for iRacing that a guy named Romain Rob created uh, on Race Department. He's on the Sim Hub Discord as well. Fantastic piece of software. Uh, and then specific to this wheel, 
um, not the other two that I have up there. Um, this has its own screen, which means it needs its own piece of software. Um, again, kind of rinky-dink software, but is what it is. Uh, that is a separate button, this cube controls button that launches that piece of software. We'll say yes to that. Uh, that will boot up and this will light up. Um, other things to mention. Um, everything is on buttons within reach. Uh, I have my headset here. I use a wireless mod mic. Uh, it clips on to the outside edge of the headphones. I don't always need it. Uh, I don't always want to race with it on and in the way. Um, so I used the second clip and just mounted it right here in easy position. Um, shifters, seatbelts stuff. This is uh, the Sim Experience GS5 seat. So I do use seatbelts with it. That limits the amount of movement I can have when I'm in the cockpit because I want to be strapped down as tightly as I possibly can be to that seat. Um, I, after a bunch of experimentation, figured out a way to fit the H pattern, the handbrake, and the sequential all in here at the same time uh, and within easy reach. Uh, I use them to varying degrees. Uh, I do a lot of skippy and radical racing in this, uh, and then the Lotus 79 with this, and then the handbrake I don't use as much, but um, I'd love to have it mounted in a vertical position, but this is what I could fit and make work. Let's see, is there anything else worth note? Yes, audio balance, I'll get to that in a second. Um, having some place to set stuff, really important. I have a mouse pad that I can mount to the 8020. I have a cup holder that I can mount to the 8020, but I don't use either of them because these are um, gigantic amps powering two LFEs and two butt kicker advances. And this entire thing is going to start vibrating as soon as I sit down, which means anything, uh, a drink, a mouse, anything that's not bolted down extremely tightly is going to go flying as soon as I fire it up. So I have this whole thing kind of slid over into the corner. I'm using this little Ikea storage cabinet thing uh, as a mouse pad that is not physically connected to the rest of the rig. And that's very important. Um, we live in an old house, small house, um, that does not have any sort of air conditioning. So I have an air conditioning unit behind me that would generally be pointed at my back here. Um, all of this builds up a lot of heat. I have a little race timing clock that has a thermometer on it. It is 77 degrees in this corner uh, right now, and I'm not even running this. Um, so I have a remote that I can flip that on with. Um, gloves are within easy reach. Uh, controls on the amps, I don't touch that often, but they are in easy reach as well. I have a 10-port um, USB hub that is connecting most of the peripherals, and I have it mounted so I can see if one of those is not connecting, if I'm having any sort of issue, I can see the lights um, corresponding to each item, and I have those laid out in a specific way um, so I can tell what is or isn't working. Uh, similarly, USB space is always at a premium on the computer. Anything that I need to plug or unplug regularly, like uh, the wheel if it loses its connection, little fiddly bits uh, I have routed up here to the top and then just using a little cable gable thing right here to make them look somewhat pretty. Everything else is routed to the back. Um, I am not using an audio card because I'm using the onboard 5.1 to power the shakers. These speakers are powered through optical audio and then the um, THX amp DAC combo that powers the headphones is uh, run through USB. I think the only other thing worth noting, um, let's see, one, one other thing before we get to the sound stuff. Um, obviously, small house, not a lot of space, needs to look pretty because it's smack dab in the middle of the living room uh, because we don't have space for it to be anywhere else. My wife uh, very kindly allowed me to, to build this gigantic stupid machine in the middle of our living room. She's lovely. Um, but um, needing, needing it to be somewhat 
quiet uh, and compact enough to fit in the corner meant no motion. Uh, I do have these big shakers, but they are isolated. The entire rig sits on these um, big butt kicker damping feet. Um, so most of the, the shake won't transfer through to the floor. Um, our bedroom is right there and she can be sleeping and not be disturbed by the amount of shaking coming through the floor. Um, similarly, the seat rails, which are hanging the two LFEs for back left and right suspension, as well as the advance um, under the kind of the lower back butt area that handles RPM and gear shift are all float mounted on these rubber dampers, um, two per foot for a total of eight. Um, that means that everything flexes just a little bit, um, but that's a necessary evil to get things to be relatively quiet um, overall. While I'm down in this position, you can see as well the big control box needed to power the seat here is just VHB'd onto the outside edge of that cabinet. Uh, and then cabling is all meh, not, not looking super good after I, after I reworked this this last week, but is passable for the time being. Um, so I think the final thing that I have to share with this whole setup is this little guy. Uh, this Korg Nano Controller fits um, an interesting niche. I had a problem um, when I'm racing in HDR, Windows OSD breaks HDR. So God forbid in the middle of a race you're in HDR, you touch a volume key or a skip track button or something, the little pop-up window right here shows up and it says, oh, you've adjusted your volume. But Microsoft doesn't have that workable in HDR, so it breaks to SDR, uh, which causes the screen to go black for two to three seconds um, to display that. And then it goes black again for two to three seconds and then comes back up in full HDR, which is not ideal um, when you're in the middle of a race, especially when you have, um, you know, teammates on Discord, you have maybe some music going, um, and then game audio all to balance. Um, I think if, if you're like me, you want things to be as loud as they possibly can without um, causing any grievous bodily harm. Um, and that's what, that's what this allows me to do. So this is a little USB mixer. It's about a $50 thing from Korg, uh, a music company. Uh, and then I have individual programs mapped to it and outputs mapped to it um, in these little sliders. So iRacing, Crew Chief, Spotify or Tidal, Chrome, uh, Discord, and then global volume for speakers and headphones. Um, so if I'm sitting in here and I've got people in Discord and I'm racing, um, with one reach, I can come over here and lower the iRacing volume so I can hear Discord. I can bring Discord up. Um, I can adjust the global volume all uh, within easy reach in a way that doesn't break HDR. And I think, I think that is everything. I'm sure that as soon as I turn off this camera, I will forget something that I was missing, but I'm sure you guys will be kind enough to help remind me as well. Um, if you found this interesting, if you are curious about everything else that I've spent the last two years of my life kind of single-mindedly um, working towards in every capacity possible, uh, let me know. I'm happy to make uh, a little bit bigger tour of what I'm using, why I'm using it, uh, and how I landed on here uh, in an effort to help you avoid making the expensive mistakes I did as I was test running all of this stuff. Um, hopefully um, you're, you're a member of the Seattle iRacing Discord. Um, one of the goals of that is to bring people together so they can try this stuff without buying it. I know I spent a whole lot more money than I really needed to just trying things uh, from, you know, the nether reaches of the internet that you don't have a chance to touch or feel or try ahead of purchasing. We have a surprising amount of people in the area. Even if you're not in the Seattle area, I'm sure that you have other people around as well. So using that as a resource, um, but hopefully sharing, sharing that knowledge can help you avoid spending some money in the future, or at least helping you to spend it in the right way, because Lord knows none of this is cheap. And I think that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. Signing off.